Good morning, everybody. Still got a few minutes left of morning. I have been working on this um, next blog. Now, um, we have been looking at the spiritual gifts. Okay, we've just entered our fourth week on this topic. And um, so I want to do just a quick recap uh, of what we've covered so far. So, um, our foundational scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 12, um, which I will read a little later. Um, but first, before I do that, I just wanted to recap that we've, um, we're up to, um, I'm calling it part seven, <laughs> but we have actually had a lot more videos than that. I think we've had, I think we might be doing the 10th one now. Um, and so things do get a little bit overlappy that way. But anyway, in part one, we set Jesus as the bar of what it is to operate in the spiritual gifts as a man filled with the spirit and the word of God. Okay, so that was part one. And, um, and we also laid out the list of what the spiritual gifts are. And also, because there's nine spiritual gifts, but also the nine fruit of the Spirit as well, which we will move into when we complete this uh, this topic here. All right, so now after that, we went into part two. And part two looked at, began to look at the Revelation gifts. And I was covering, there are three categories of um, gifts just for teaching purposes. And um, the three categories are the Revelation gifts, the power gifts, and the utterance gifts. Um, the utterance gifts are also known as the oral or inspiration gifts, okay? And seven of the nine gifts did operate in the Old Testament, and we will get to that again a little bit later. Now, um, the first two that we looked at in part two were the Word of Wisdom, which is a supernatural um, revelation. The, um, the thing about the revelation gifts, they all reveal something of the mind of God. The power gifts all do something through the supernatural enabling of God. And the utterance gifts all say something inspirational from God. And all of them are purely inspirational, not able to be done in any kind of natural way or by the arm of the flesh. If they can be done that way, it's not the spiritual gifts, okay? Um, because the spiritual gifts can only be done by the Holy Spirit as he determines, when he determines, through whom he determines, and why, okay? Because it's actually the gifts, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the word of wisdom is a supernatural revelation of something that is to come. A word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation of a fact or an event that is present or past, um, but is relevant to, um, like you might not have known about it, but it was needed. It was something that you said that uh, caused a person to marvel at that God should know this about you or something like that. All right, so um, there's plenty of examples in the blogs and in the videos that go with them. Okay, um, the next revelation gift is the discerning of spirits, which is incredibly important at this point in our world history because there is so much deception. We literally live in the age of deception, the age of distraction, <laughs> the age of diversion, um, all of these Ds, you know, like we live in a time that is um, that is so manic that the ability to focus on something is actually considered one of the highest commodities at all. All right, because most people can't focus anymore. They're so out of the habit. It's not because they don't have the ability, but they've lost the practice of being able to focus and concentrate. Hello. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the, this is really important, the discerning of spirits, to be able to, um, through the revelation of God, see what source is behind what's happening. Um, but there is a definition, a proper definition for that in that blog as well. Um, then we have the power gifts. And this is part four. With the power gifts, we have the gift of special faith, the gifts of healings, and the working of miracles. And of course, everybody loves these ones. And this is what you saw so much of Jesus doing. Um, and they're more obvious, I guess. Like Jesus operated in all of these, and it actually is recorded. You know, there are different times where it says that Jesus, have, knowing all that was about to happen, which means God had given him a word of knowledge, right? Um, or like when he said of Lazarus, this sickness will not end in death. That's because God had already shown him by the gift of the word of wisdom that he was going to raise Lazarus up. So Jesus had already seen it, all right, in, this, in the spirit, okay? Um, so we have the power gifts, and they all do something that cannot be done 
in the natural course of things. Um, the gift of special faith is a supernatural power from God to receive a miracle. The gifts of healings is a supernatural ability from God to remove disease and sickness and infirmity. And the gifts of uh, the working of miracles is the supernatural ability or power from God to produce a miracle and a miracle is an intervention in the natural course of things a miracle is not when something coincides and you get the synchronicity and it's like the perfect situation but it's still all flesh all right and it, a, a miracle is when something that could not have happened in the flesh takes place like an arm grows back or um someone's raised from the dead <laughs> or uh you know things like that it's, the sun goes backwards you know, these are miracles. When Joshua, the sun stood still for Joshua, that was a miracle. All right. So um, when the axe head floated, that was a miracle. Axe heads don't float. They sink generally. Okay. So, you know, a miracle is when there is an intervention in the natural course of things. Okay. And then we move into the utterance gifts. And that's where we've been for for this week. We will be this, this week and last week. And the reason it's taking a bit longer to get through these ones is because they're laced with um, other teachings. You know, between chapter uh, first, first Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul starts speaking about the spiritual gifts, um, and then first Corinthians chapter 14, where he concludes with a whole chapter on prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues. Uh, in between, of course, is sandwiched the love chapter, but the second half of first Corinthians chapter 12 is also about the body and how you know the whole of the body works together as god determined it should and um, there's no point looking at the different gifts that god gives to members of the body of christ without actually acknowledging the fact that each one is given the gifts that god has determined they need in order to fulfill their part in the body and it's only as the members of the body come together and operate that the body is able to be built up in love the way that it is intended to. And so we looked at that last, uh, the last blog, um, I kind of looked probably more at the body than, than anything else. Uh, the one prior to that, we looked at the diverse kinds of tongues and the fact that uh, the diverse kinds of tongues is an, a supernatural um, utterance that is not in a language that is not known to the speaker all right so it doesn't matter what kind of language it is it's the supernatural utterance that is not known to the speaker and interpretation of tongues or, and we broke that down I broke it down into the different kinds of diverse tongues that we could experience and encounter um, and then we looked at uh, the interpretation of tongues is uh, supernatural uh, interpretation not translation they're two different things a supernatural interpretation of a tongue that is not known to you naturally all right but it's given to you through the gifts of the Holy Spirit and then prophecy is a supernatural utterance in a known tongue okay and some would even say that um, tongues and interpretation equal the gift of prophecy because if you have someone who prophesies in a tongue that no one understands but then you have an interpretation given whether by him or another person then it still comes through as a prophecy that's understood and able to edify the body all right and that's proverb uh, that's corinthians chapter 14 that really goes into prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues and i'm still yet to get there and the reason is because today when i came to doing this um i was looking at how to move on because I just feel like there's so much added information between between uh, you know first Corinthians 12 and first Corinthians 14 there's just this a whole dimension of information um, and so it's like I feel like I'm kind of stuck there trying to work through these different elements but Paul saw fit to put them right there and so I really want to you know um, even if all I'm doing is skating across the top and giving you food for thought to pursue in your own study, I really think that it's worthwhile to do that here. So today, moving on, where I'm, I'm going to continue. Like last week, we uh, sort of on Thursday, I looked at the body and how all these gifts are, you know, given to us, whether they're the spiritual gifts, the fivefold ministry gifts, 
their so-called motivational gifts. Uh, it doesn't matter which gifts they are. You know, the new birth, resurrection, um, a new heart, new spirit, all of these things are gifts that God gives us. Your natural life is a gift that God gave you. Your natural talents and abilities are all gifts that God has given you. Everything you have, we have is a gift from God, basically. But he has packaged us individually with all of these things so that we fit into a very specific place in the body to fulfill his purpose. Okay, and so and we looked at that last week when we um, covered more on the body. <clears throat> and even though um, the body might seem off topic because it's not about the spiritual gifts, um, there's nowhere where Paul discusses gifts where he doesn't bring it into the context of the body and the fact that it is for the service of others and to build others up and it's for the common good none of the gifts that we have is just for us we may benefit and be blessed by the fact that we can enjoy them in our lives but they are there to be given for the benefit for the manifold grace of God to serve others which is what it says in first Peter I'm just gonna um, just gonna read that since I've got to it <laughs> um, but it does, the Bible says that each one of us is given gifts, um, each one, and each one is placed in the body according to the design of God. So, you know, he knows where your gift fits, and in every day, he'll provide you, if you ask him, he'll provide you with ways to use the gifts and the things that you have in your hands to be able to be a blessing to the body. You know, you don't have to be in fivefold ministry, you don't have to be in church, you don't have to be anywhere specific to be able to use the gifts that God has placed in your hand right now today to be a blessing to somebody all right um, and it doesn't one person is enough Jesus would have died for one person how much more should we use whatever gifts we have to be a blessing to just one it doesn't have to be a multitude you know um, okay so in first Peter chapter 4 it says each one should use whatever gift he has received uh, to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in all its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be all the glory and power forever and ever. Amen, of course. All right, so that, that means that whatever gifts we have, they are there to be a blessing to the body. So anytime gifts should be discussed, there should be a discussion about the body. All right, so that's kind of brought us almost up to date. There is one other thing that I needed to um, come into again, and that is the fact that the Bible says at the end of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians to eagerly desire the best gifts. All right, he puts it all into context of the body, and then he says to everybody that's hearing the letter, eagerly desire the best gifts. Okay, and so, um, and then he goes straight into, and now I'll show you the most excellent way. All right, and there isn't a chapter division right there. If you um, read straight through from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that goes straight into 1 Corinthians chapter 13 without any chapter breaks. Okay, um, 1 Corinthians, hang on, flick, flick. Um, get in there. Okay, so. Um, I just want to remind you too that I didn't read <laughs> I didn't read our foundation of scripture of of um, first Corinthians chapter 12 but I would like to just remind you of the first verse which says that now about concerning spiritual gifts brethren I do not want you to be ignorant which is why we're doing all of this okay we want to know about the spiritual gifts we want to see them flourishing in the body the way they ought to because Jesus said um, that people need to see the miracles and the works that he does in order for the message and the the purposes of God to be completed. And that's in John 15. He says, if I hadn't come and done what no one else had done, they wouldn't be guilty of their sin. But because I did come, they saw the miracles. People need to see the miracles um, and a demonstration that goes with the word of God, not just talk. You know, the world is done with talking, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So we need to actually be believing God and standing for the power and demonstration of the Spirit to confirm the word with signs and wonders following. Amen. 
Amen. And if we don't even look for that or aim for that or or have an education and understanding, sorry, about the gifts, then we're just going to fumble on through without them and that's not going to that's not the full gospel. That's not the message that Jesus gave. That's not the complete truth of who he is and what he came to do. All right? So um and I don't see that uh, you know, I mean, anything special to be able to accomplish any of these things, it's by the grace of God and the Spirit of God. But we have to at least eagerly desire these things. Eagerly desire these things. When was the last time you consciously, eagerly desired to see the power and the demonstration of God's Spirit go forth with His signs and wonders following? Okay, so that's become conscious of that. All right, now, so the end of chapter 12, it says, But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. And it goes straight into, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding glong, gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Can you imagine doing any of those things? and not actually being motivated by the love of God. How amazing to be able to function in those gifts and yet not know God because God is love, right? God is love. This is the revelation I got today. God is love, all right? So if we have not love, we still haven't got God in there. Do you get that? If we do all of these things, we operate in all these spiritual gifts because they're not dependent upon the fruit of the Spirit. They're not dependent upon us. If all of these things function through us, but yet we have not love, we still don't know God. And that's why those people could be there saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not heal the sick? You know, and he says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. They never knew love, right? And the reason that love is the most excellent and the most important, and I did cover this on Thursday, but I didn't fully put it in the notes, so I tried to include it a little bit more today, is that, you know, the Bible says, this is good, all right? The Bible says, um, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For now we know in part and prophesy in part, but when the perfection comes and the imperfect disappears, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And then it says, and now these three remain, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. Right? And the thing that's important about all of that is that love never fails. Everything else will stop. You know, that whole passage starts with love never fails. Prophecies won't be needed. Tongues won't be needed. Raising people from the dead won't be needed. Healing sick won't be needed. Um, you know, revelation gifts won't be needed because we'll already know everything because we'll be one in the unity of the Spirit with the Lord. So none of these things will make it into the next age because they're not needed in the next age. Neither is faith and hope because we will already be living in the life that we look to now with faith and hope. The hope that we have is Jesus coming back, rapturing his bride, taking us to live with him, and he rules and reigns in righteousness in the new millennium, and we will too. But we'll be doing it. We won't need hope and faith for it. We'll be in it, right? So everything else goes. But God is love. And so the love of God, the love that is God, will continue forever and eternally and that's why everything else is irrelevant compared to the love of God and so you know all of these things will pass get the focus right get the priorities right understand what actually is eternal is God himself and he is love so if we don't do everything in love then we still haven't caught on to what God is really trying to do, which is demonstrate the power of his love for people, for his creation, to be able to bring them into the new age. He wants people to come into that time with him and to enjoy having God live together with his people. Amen? Holy nation. All right, now here's the cool thing with the end of chapter 12 where it says, 
eagerly desire the greater gifts and now I will show you the most excellent way of love and then the beginning of chapter 14 says follow the way of love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts especially the gift of prophecy so the interesting thing here is that the bookends the bookends of eagerly desiring the gifts and following the way of love uh, are there right he sets that right there on either end between chapter 12 and chapter 14 before he goes on into the gifts of prophecy and tongues now i was planning on moving into prophecy today but as happens sometimes the lord took me on a little deviation and so i wanted to share this with you um okay now it comes down to genesis chapter 11 there it is now genesis chapter 11 for those of you who don't know Oh, hi Bridget. <laughs> Genesis, chapter, Genesis chapter 11 is about the Tower of Babel. Now before I mentioned that all of the spiritual gifts, seven of the nine were present in the Old Testament. Okay, but the two that weren't present were the diverse kinds of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now this is really interesting because in Genesis 11 we know up till that point that everyone in the world spoke the same language. All right, so this is the important significance of tongues in the Old Testament. Like we can say, well, tongues didn't exist, interpretation of tongues didn't exist, but the important thing is that everyone actually spoke the same language until the Tower of Babel when God came and actually confused the language and made them all babbling so they couldn't understand each other. All right, and the thing is that up until that point, they had one language, they communicated well, and it unified them. It unified them so that they could do anything that they imagined to do. Unfortunately, they were men with evil hearts and intents, and Satan was their God, and so what they imagined and intended to do were not good things. All right, but even the Lord said, and I'm going to read it to you. Hold on. Um, Okay, um, I'm just going to read you from chapter 5 to chapter, uh, to, sorry, from verse 5 to verse 9. It says, but the Lord came down to see the city. Actually, no, I won't. I'll read you the whole thing. It's not there. It's not that long. I'll just find it. Genesis chapter 11. Um, okay, here we are. All right, Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Then they said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar instead of mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city um, with a tower that reaches to the heavens. They wanted to hit the firmament so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they imagine will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. Now, is bad communication the source of every issue? <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> aside from evil intentions. Um, because even when there aren't evil intentions, when people haven't understood each other, that's basically the problem, right? Communication breakdown. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. This is why it was called Babel or Babel, which is also, you know, Babylon, because it means it sounds like the word for confused. Um, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. So this little diversion into um, tongues in the Old Testament, language in the Old Testament, um, I found very interesting because what God has done in the New Testament by giving us the spiritual gift of diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues is actually restore a kind of unity spiritually that the world has never ever seen isn't that cool when was the last time you thought about something like that god has given us in tongues and interpretation of tongues a spiritual gift and a, the the potential for a unity common language that no man on earth can understand 
And when we speak by the Holy Spirit in our own prayer language, no one, heaven, angels or men, understand because we speak mysteries to God. But we all do it by the um, power of the Holy Spirit living in us. I'm just wondering if my screen's gone dark. Just wondering if it's short of power. No, that's not it. Anyway, so the thing is that the Holy Spirit, when we pray in the Spirit, we've actually had a unity, like the potential for unity, because it's actually one Spirit that's praying. All right, when we pray in the Spirit, it's one person, one mind, it's one God, one will, one purpose, one intention that's actually going forth. All right, so we have the, the capacity through these spiritual gifts of tongues and interpretation and our prayer language to bring a unity in the body that the world has never seen before, except at the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, where we see what God did at the outset when he first, first brought, baptized the Holy Spirit and fire, baptizes the church in the Holy Spirit and fire. So this is a kind of um, a, a reversal, I guess. It's, it's not even because it's not natural. It's supernatural. It's spiritual. Whereas the first common language and what they were able to do just in, on the from the fleshly side, what they were able to do in the flesh with a common language cannot be compared to what the church can do with the unity of the spirit and the power of a common language, spiritually speaking. Are you getting this? I know I'm kind of like botching up delivering it, but basically this is what I was seeing. So um, that's why I wanted to sort of take the time to look at this. Um, now, the thing is that in natural terms, back in 2000, when I was doing a, um, a creative arts, cross arts degree at university, I entered some works into um, an art exhibition. And basically, I did a, a study on the fact that science and technology were fast becoming the new gods, right? This was 20 years ago. You know, so, and I know that God operates in this, this is prophetic stuff, right? So we could see that science and technology were becoming the new gods because people think that through science and technology, they can do what they couldn't do just as regular people. And um, I guess the devil offers science technology as an alternative to spiritual capacity and things, you know, like we turn to science and technology instead of turning to God. And I'm not maligning anybody for, for doing anything like that. I'm just saying that these tools that are neutral tools that are meant for the good of man were developed primarily um, through military uh, and for military purposes but then they you know slowly get washed over into the mass population because the devil has bigger agendas but um, they were devised as tools to be used in warfare and um, and they are used that way and extended and developed that way as well. But they are neutral tools, so it doesn't mean that they don't have good that they can offer as well. It's up to, you know, it's like money. It depends on what people are doing with it that matters, and it's the intention behind it. But um, my point here is that people think that science and technology, digital languages have become the natural form of uh, one language. So, you know, in my art exhibition, I created an artwork that was a collage made of um, some different things that were taken from popular material, all right? So, you know, magazines on success and things like that. And I actually had, it was called 21st Century Babel, this particular work, and it was using um, a cannon, like it wasn't a cannonball, it was actually a ball and chain which is an, an imprisonment icon, all right? So this was a bondage uh, comment, not a freeing one. All right, so um, the the ball at the end of the chain represented a globe, and there were four little iconic men sitting at computers at the north, south, east, and west, tying the whole world together through that whole technology visually, right? And it was called 21st Century Babel. And the point of the whole concept of this visual concept was to point out that man has taken all this time but has finally got to the place where he has devised a single language once more. And his goal is to bring in that one world government through that single language and once more dominate the world, you know, and be God in the in this place. But the thing is that in while, while they've done that, while man has done that, 
God has brought his Holy Spirit, like that's the counterfeit kind of version of one language, but God has brought a spiritual version of unity and language, and he's done that through the spiritual gifts of diverse kind of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Now I realize that this is kind of like off um, a simple use of what these are, but the whole point I think of Paul giving tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy an extra chapter is because they have huge um, capacity to to make a massive kind of difference that maybe is not so obvious to us initially all right and so with this language comes the ability with these the spiritual gifts of tongues comes the ability to bring a unity that allows God to do something amazing in the world and we saw that with the book of Acts in chapter 2 and how you know it says in chapter 4 it says everybody was in unity all the believers were of one accord through the unity of the spirit the unity of the spirit and when we pray in tongues when we pray in our heavenly languages when we um, allow God to you know use us that way and I've covered um, the different kinds of prayer that we can do or the different kind of uses of tongues in um, a blog two blogs ago and I put a link in this one so um, you know when you look at what God can do this is what he can do he can build us up as the body of Christ into a unity which is what it talks about in Ephesians and I covered that in last week's blog the last blog all right so hopefully hopefully this has actually made some kind of sense or sown a seed that gives you something to seek out for yourself the fact that um, tongues like you don't have to aim and shoot at the devil you just pray in the spirit you just you just talk to the Lord you utter mysteries via the gifts that he has given you to in your heavenly language and in your own prayer time but while you're doing that he is shooting fiery brands at all that is demonic at all that is dark and he is doing that so we need to make ourselves available to be doing that on a more and more consistent basis I believe myself included um, you know so I guess my, my goal today, or what I would like to leave you with, is that I truly believe that the reinstating of, not that they were ever taken away by God, but the reinstating of all of the gifts of the Spirit are the true Christian normal. And all this garbage about new normals everywhere, it's a new birth normal, new birth normal. That's what we should be holding on to. And, um, and that new birth normal includes the full manifestation of all the different spiritual gifts that God has given and whatever gifts he has put in your hand today whatever you have to do today that's your gift and you are expected of the Lord to be able to sow that gift not bury it remember that last week the difference between sowing and burying they look really similar but one actually accomplishes um, life bearing fruit and the other doesn't all right so um, how do I want to finish this Okay, yes, so I truly believe that that reinstating of all these gifts should be what we think about all the time, the, reinst the new birth normal of what the church is and that it's going to usher in the final moments before the Lord's return and reveal the hearts of those who are and are not with him. It will do that too um, and bring forth the glorious church in all her radiant splendor because Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. He is coming back for a glorious church. Not a defeated one, not a browbeaten one, not a hiding one, a glorious church. Amen. That's us. That's us. Yes. So um, just to uh, hit that final point again, that we have this ability through the diverse kinds of tongues, the spiritual gift of tongues, the interpretation of tongues, the heavenly language that we've been given to help to cultivate a deeper form of unity in the, in the body of Christ and to actually make a stand against the works of the enemy because Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Don't you believe it for a second? Amen. The light wins. The light wins. We know the end of the story. Hallelujah. All right. 
But I'm going to leave you there, Father. I just thank you that you seal this word, that, Lord, whatever revelation you want to highlight and bring forth from the seed that's been sown, Father God, that you would be able to take it and see it multiply 30, 60, and 100 fold. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for the demonstration of your spirit to confirm that word with signs and wonders following. And I thank you for the desire in your people to eagerly, eagerly, eagerly desire the greater gifts and to follow the way of love. Hallelujah. We just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Oh, have a good rest of your day. And I'll be back again on Wednesday, um, I think, with prophecy <laughs> going into chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians so that we can look at um, how tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy are used to edify the body, which is what that subject's all about, that chapter is all about. Okay, I see you, see you again soon. Bye for now.